Hey guys, Mr. P. In this video, we're going to talk about understanding B226, which is functional benefits of the double membrane of the nucleus. This includes the need for pores in the nuclear membrane and for the nucleus to break into vesicles during mitosis and meiosis. So in this particular video, we're going to talk about how the nuclear envelope is structured, how those structures allow it to function correctly, and then, like this understanding says, we're going to focus on how the membrane dissolves and comes back together during times of cell division, which is mitosis and meiosis. So the first thing we need to do when discussing the idea of the eukaryotic cell nucleus is identify the functions of this particular organelle. And so the first function is the nucleus stores the cell's genetic material. All of the cell's DNA is housed within the cell nucleus. And the second would be the nucleus coordinates the cell's activities, including growth, metabolism, protein synthesis, and division. The cell nucleus is not only the hub where all of the inheritance or the inherited information is kept in, i.e. the DNA, it is also the governing body of the entire cell. So, the first of these structures would be the nuclear pores. If you notice, the nuclear envelope has these pores called nuclear pores that are allowing the passage of materials, which can be ions, which are charged molecules, small molecules, RNA, like our RNA, specifically the ribosomes, to get in and out between the cytoplasm and the nucleoplasm. The cytoplasm would be the fluid inside of the cell membrane, but outside of the nuclear envelope. And the nucleoplasm would be the same type of substance, but inside the nuclear envelope. So we need, as a cell, to get materials into and out of our nucleus, and these pores allow the passage of those materials in and out. The nucleoplasm is the fluid that contains the inactive form of DNA called chromatin. We're going to talk a lot about chromatin and chromosomes in later videos, but for now, chromatin are these long stringy strands of DNA, which is an inactive form of DNA. DNA is going to supercoil into chromosomes during times of active cell division, which would be the active form of DNA. But when DNA is inactive, it is in the form of chromatin. The nucleolus would be this really dense core inside of the nucleus. It is RNA protein complexes are produced in this region, specifically ribosomes, which would be made in the nucleolus and then would leave the nucleus through these nuclear pores. And on the outside of the nucleus would be this nuclear membrane. The nuclear membrane provides an area where DNA can carry out its functions without being affected by processes occurring in other parts of the cell. It creates a compartment that all of these particular nuclear processes and nuclear functions can happen without the risk of being denatured by other metabolic processes within the cytoplasm. The nuclear envelope, like we said, is this double-membraned structure on the outside of our nucleus. The outer nuclear membrane is on the outside and the inner nuclear membrane is on the inside, both of which account for this nuclear envelope. It is important to note that the outer nuclear envelope, if you were to kind of continue along it, is completely continuous with the rough ER. We've said in previous videos that the rough ER is the closest organelle to the nucleus. That is because both of them have very similar functions. The nucleus, in addition to housing the DNA, produces those ribosomes. Ribosomes would immediately exit the nucleus out through these nuclear pores and usually would embed themselves within the membrane of this rough ER, which is why, again, the rough ER needs to be closely associated with the nucleus. The nucleus shares some functions with the ER, like I said, as ribosomes are often observed attached to the outer nuclear membrane. So in addition to the rough ER's membrane being studded with ribosomes, a lot of times you would actually see the nuclear envelope or the outer membrane of the nuclear envelope studded with these ribosomes as well both of which are very continuous. It is in fact the exact same membrane that surrounds not only the nucleus, but creates the rough endoplasmic reticulum. The outer membrane can also form vesicles like the ER. So vesicles can bud off of the outer nuclear membrane, just like vesicles can bud off of our rough ER. The inner membrane interacts with the chromatin and is important in maintaining the shape of the nucleus. So think about the inner nuclear membrane being completely consistent with all of the inner nuclear components like chromatin. It allows for the nucleus to maintain its shape, whereas this outer nuclear envelope is continuous with the rough ER and kind of performs an extra layer of, of protection for the inner components of that nucleus. And if we dive into the nuclear envelope in a little more detail, you would see that in a cross-section of the nuclear envelope, 
The inner and outer nuclear membranes share a center and are therefore considered concentric membranes. They are not two separate membranes. They are actually almost like one continuous membrane, but they have a void that they share between the inner and the outer membranes. These membranes are considered concentric membranes and they allow for the passage of materials in and out through these pores. The nuclear pores create a passageway through which small polar molecules, ions, and macromolecules can pass between the nucleus and the cytoplasm. These nuclear pores are fairly large and can allow the passage of materials both into and out of the nucleus through them as long as the size of the nuclear pore is conducive to that particular molecule. In vertebrates, the nuclear pores are composed of 50 to 100 different proteins. If you were to zoom into an actual nuclear pore, you would see all these individual shapes and all of those individual colors would be individual proteins. In vertebrates, like us, humans, and other animals, we have roughly 50 to 100 different proteins that make up the structure that is the nuclear pore. So, diving into the nuclear pore in a little more detail, you would see that the proteins we just talked about produce the structural integrity or the structural components of these openings, ribosomes in the cytoplasm synthesize all proteins necessary for proper genome structure and function. So what are the processes that these proteins synthesized by the ribosomes are going to allow Histones. We've talked about DNA structure a little bit. Histones are those protein spools that allow our long stringy strands of nucleotides to wind around in order to provide our DNA with some structure. DNA topoisomerase is an enzyme we're going to talk about in a lot more detail when we talk DNA replication, but this is one of the main enzymes that is utilized within the process of DNA replication in order to unwind and relax the coils on our double helix of DNA. DNA helicase is another DNA replication enzyme. That enzyme is responsible for breaking hydrogen bonds in order to unzip our DNA molecule. DNA polymerase 1 and 3 are two enzymes that, again, are going to interact in a process called DNA replication that will actually help synthesize the new strand of DNA by linking individual DNA nucleotides in the proper fashion. RNA polymerase is an enzyme that is going to be used during, again, DNA replication. Its job is to place RNA primers. Those primers are going to provide our DNA polymerase 3 a place to start in order to synthesize DNA correctly. Transcription factors are a set of proteins that will help transcribe our DNA into RNA so that we can then take RNA and turn it into protein in a process called protein synthesis. Splicing factors are proteins that are going to help in a process called RNA modification. And there are a ton more proteins and enzymes that are going to help play a role in metabolism, both catabolic and anabolic reactions. But there are a variety of proteins that are going to be synthesized by these ribosomes in order to produce a variety of functions within the cell that allow us to efficiently run like we should. Ribosomes, mRNA, and tRNA are produced in the nucleus but must enter the cytoplasm in order to participate in transcription and translation. Transcription, translation are two processes that come together to ultimately produce a process called protein synthesis. Protein synthesis would be the biological reaction in order to produce proteins. So, like the understanding says, nuclear envelope in the processes of cell division, both mitosis and meiosis. Now, in this video, the purpose is not to highlight the processes of cell division. We're not going to talk about the phases of mitosis or meiosis, even though they are, in fact, listed on the screen. We are focusing exclusively on the nuclear envelope. And so when cells are not actively dividing, they are in a phase called interphase. Again, we're going to talk about these phases in a lot more detail when we get to actual cell division. But for now, interphase is a phase in which the cell is doing normal daily activities. A skin cell is behaving and acting like a skin cell. Brain cells are interacting and behaving like a brain cell. Muscle cells are muscle cells. Bone cells are bone cells. The nuclear envelope is incredibly intact because the DNA is kept in that chromatin phase, and so the DNA is completely inactive because it is a time in which the cell is not actively dividing. When the cell prepares itself for cell division, that DNA is going to condense and supercoil into the active form, which is called chromosomes. So chromosomes would be our active form of DNA. Chromatin 
would be our inactive form. When the DNA becomes activated and supercoils into the chromosome phase, you will see that this solid blue line, which would be the nuclear envelope, is going to decondense a little bit and produce this dotted blue line, which indicates that the nuclear envelope is dissolving. We want to initially dissolve it so that we can actually more easily get to these chromosomes with the use of these spindle fibers. And then ultimately, if I go all the way to the end, we need to reform the nuclear envelope around our new two nuclei before we divide the cell through cytokinesis and ultimately produce two cells from one. But while we are dissolving this, we want to be as efficient as possible, and so we don't want to just tear this down and completely remake it from scratch. The cell wants to break down the nuclear envelope, store it in vesicles until it is needed, and then just reassemble the pieces. It is a lot more efficient that way. And so the first thing, nuclear envelope is complete during interphase. That is so normal cell activities, and again, the DNA is inactive and in the form of chromatin. Nuclear envelope breaks down and is contained within nuclear vesicles. Again, it breaks down because the DNA is activated, it is supercoiled into the chromosomes, and we have initiated the cell division phase. Once the nuclear envelope is completely broken down and stored within these nuclear vesicles, it is now out of the way. Notice it is completely gone. The DNA can then go ahead and divide itself. Once the DNA has completely divided itself and we have two complete sets of new unduplicated chromosomes, the vesicles that contain all the nuclear envelope components attach themselves to the surface of the chromosomes. The vesicles then fuse to form continuous membrane around the chromosomes and the nuclear envelope reforms at the end of cell division. As soon as that nuclear envelope reassembles from the components that were stored in those nuclear vesicles, the cell can then pinch in in a process called cleavage furrow and cytokinesis before it completely separates, forming two daughter cells from one parent cell. That is the way the nuclear envelope is structured, and that is the way the nuclear envelope behaves in times of cell division. If you learned something, give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel, leave your questions in the comments. See ya.